Well, um, it's an honor, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I flew in late last night, um, also giving uh, another talk at a conference, at an international conference in Hong Kong. Um, I'm headquartered, I'm based in Hong Kong, but travel uh, frequently around the world to share um, about green living, green eating, and if uh, have the opportunity to talk, to talk about mindfulness and a little bit about Buddhism, also to share how mindfulness can definitely be applied to the workplace and make us become much more efficient, become happier workers, and also happier workplace. Um, I wrote different books, uh, a little bit also similar to Meng, um, not as best-selling as his books are, um, but talking about Zen in the workplace, Zen in working relationship, people relationship. Um, and I myself have benefited tremendously from practicing meditation, from learning how to be mindful, um, what does it mean to be compassionate and loving. And one of the areas that people tend to forget um, although it's so obvious, that is, an, is a target that we should definitely be very compassionate towards, but we often overlook is actually our environment, our planet. When we talk about loving compassion, we definitely think about towards our family, friends, co-workers, or ourselves. Uh, but one entity, one party that is very ill, very sick, and desperately need us to give compassion and love to is our planet, is Mother Earth. So I started, along with uh, another fellow co-founder, Francis, we started uh, a social enterprise and also a movement called Green Monday uh, in 2012. And we're very happy to say that in three very short years, it is growing internationally and become a way to practice mindfulness through our behavior, through, through behavior change and through our action. Uh, earlier in the presentation, I noticed there's mindful lunch um, and also uh, how to make compassion viral. And in a sense, that is also what we are trying to do, is to bundle compassion, love, care into our daily behavior through one of the activities that every single person on this planet participates, and it's called eating. Um, we started, as I said, uh, in, as a social enterprise, and the idea is we are trying to tackle two of the biggest problems on our planet today, and it's called climate change and food insecurity. Um, climate change, I believe most people in the room uh, definitely have heard about, but the other issue uh, called lack of food Given that today's conference is in Singapore, um, or many of us are from people like from different regions here, so cities like Hong Kong, I met someone from Korea, um, you probably don't think that the lack of food is that big of a problem. When you think of food, you go to supermarket or you go to the restaurant. Uh, but in reality, um, there is over there are over one billion people who are suffering from hunger today, and that number is expected to rise dramatically in the next 20, 30 years. And the UN just said that by 2030, so only 15 years from now, 2030 is very short time frame, very near future, 40% of the people in the world will be suffering from lack of clean water. So two out of five will not have sufficient clean water in simply 15 years. So love and compassion, um, as much as towards people around us, definitely towards the planet, because at the end, we are the people who will either benefit or suffer from it. These are the two biggest problems. So uh, one of the quote from National Geographic last year is when we think about threats to the environment, we picture cars, we picture you know, energy company, um, and we think of solutions like solar panels, um, wind turbines, but we rarely look at ourselves and say, what can we do to alleviate the problem and help, the, help to become part of a solution? So we picture cars, you know, energy, et cetera, but the truth is our need for food actually poses one of the biggest dangers to the planet. That's from National Geographic. When we think about global warming, I think most people know is from carbon footprint or carbon emission. So again, driving less car or, or driving um, more eco-friendly vehicles um, turning to solar energy, et cetera. These are things that we immediately come up with. But the truth is, there's one element that most people still don't know, 
but it's so obvious is the United Nations has been talking about for over a decade that the biggest culprit or contributor to carbon footprint is actually not transportation and not the energy sector. It's actually the livestock industry. Between a cow and a car, most people would think the car does more damage, right? Pollution, carbon emission. But actually, it's not even close. There is this quote, which is hard to believe, but it says that if you are a vegan, but if you drive a Hummer, you are still greener than someone who, someone who drives a Prius, but is a carnivore. <laughs> so you, you, if you eat a lot of meat, particularly if you eat beef, lamb, um, food that give out a lot of carbon, even if you think you are green, actually you're not. On the right hand side, I mean, there's actually, if you, I can list out all the food, carbon footprint comparison of all the food. But when you are eating a green meal versus when you're eating meats, particularly red meats such as lamb and beef, we're talking about at least a difference of 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. So simple, simple way that we can help the planet and become compassionate is simply by not eating as much meat. And second is water consumption. Uh, we are in Singapore today, so um, you may not, again, um, think so much about a water crisis, but there are many countries who are suffering from lack, uh, lack of clean water. And even right now from California, there is a severe drought that is, it has never seen in over a thousand years. And what causes drought? Now, climate change definitely has to do with it because as simple as simply when the planet gets hotter, of course, it gets drier and there's less water. But another factor that people overlook and even government tend to try to avoid is that livestock consumes a lot of water. When you consume a piece of stick, again, this is United Nations figure, one meal of stick you are taking away 4,600 liters of clean water. In Hong Kong, our government tell people to take one less minute of shower per day. Now, one less minute of shower save 10 liters, as you can see on the lower left-hand corner. So one less minute of shower for a year save 3,600. But one less meal of steak, 4,600. It's the easiest way to save water, but a way that no one talks about. Now, finally, land. We do not have endless or infinite amount of land and water resources. And again, growing livestock in order to feed us, rather than us simply consuming plant-based food, is a very inefficient way to produce food. The same piece of land that can feed 3,200 people if you're growing you know, plant-based food, if you turn that into a livestock farm and then feed us with meat, you can feed less than one-tenth of that. So whether in terms of land, water, and carbon footprints, simply by eating less meat, you are being, compassion, being compassionate towards the world. Not to mention the obvious, which is helping animals and reducing their suffering. Now, 2014, was the hottest year ever on record. And nine out of the 10 hottest years all happened after the millennium. There is no doubt about it that climate change is here and it is worsening at a very dramatic pace. It is by far the biggest thing that is threatening humankind right now. So when there is climate change, what happens? Well, it's called extreme climate. Obviously, in general, the weather is getting hotter and hotter. But at the same time, when it gets cold, it also gets ridiculously cold. So for example, this is just last year. I mean, just using January, we can easily, I can just go through the entire presentation showing you pictures that are stunning. Um, the picture above is not from the movie The Day After Tomorrow. <laughs> it, it was taken in Chicago, Lake Michigan. Well, Ice Michigan, I guess. Um, last year. And simple question is, can anyone survive if without heat or air conditioning? Negative 27 degrees, who can survive under those weather? 
Now, we barely can survive because we you know, build houses, we build heat, but what about animals? What about crops? What about plants? What about food in general? Can they survive? And if they don't, if they don't survive, what do we eat? I talk about California drought, so this is only three years ago, the, the one on the left. It's not like 30 years ago. It's three years ago and three years later. It can happen that dramatic. It doesn't take that long to deplete Earth resources. And of course, when there's drought, there's also flooding. And by the way, California, London, these are not developing countries. <laughs> these are the richest and most developed cities in the world. But when we are up against climate, we are defenseless. World Bank talks about the different regions that will face the highest damage when it comes to climate change. And in the states, New York, well, the, these are the usual suspects. Manhattan, definitely a uh, big part of Manhattan will be underwater. Miami, New Orleans. In Asia, um, multiple cities in China, um, definitely high on the list, including Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Tianjin. Um, and of course, in Southeast Asia, uh, Ho Chi Minh City. These are all on the top 10 list. Um, but the truth is, this is a universal problem that no one is immune. And how does climate get into food is that another major problem that makes the matter worse is that our global population is rising like out of control. Right now, we are at 7 billion. Only 40 years ago, we were at 4 billion, but 40 years later, will be at nine. So it's still one planet, right? Think, think about your home. Like, let's say your home used to fit you know, four people. Now there are seven, there will be nine. But the home is still the same home. So how do you feed that much people, especially when the health of the planet is getting worse? So one of the, one of the study from scientists, again, is that actually they expect by 2050, food production capacity will drop by 10% compared to now, when population will rise 30%. So this is very simple math, right? Population rise by 30%, food production drop by 10. And we already have 1 billion of people who are suffering from hunger. So figure that out. And that is not that far down the line. So the problem, and today's talk actually is called innovation and environment and innovation. So what is Green Monday and how do we build an innovative platform that can spread globally so that every single person can act right away? You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to install anything. You don't even have to learn anything. Um, it's an action. It's a movement that we call it simple, viral, and actionable something that you can do immediately, and you can tell your friends, your coworkers, your family, strangers, to join in as well immediately, and we call it Green Monday. Now, we look at a traditional activist approach, and we say there is something wrong with that um, mechanism. Usually, what a traditional model does is, you know, some experts or scientists, they give you some data. They do a lot of very in-depth research, and they say, at the end of the day, this is what we come up with. So the first phase is called research. The second phase, of course, is called promoting, advertising, educating. Basically, spread the words, right? Let people know about the result from that research. And then the next phase is changing mind, and then finally, changing action. But by default, an, an approach like that works like a funnel, which means that out of, let's say, you know, let's say the world is 7 billion or any country, you know, you start with 100%, but by default, it just keeps dropping off and dropping off at the end. Someone who actually would change action based on that research may be a handful. But that's not what we need. We need everyone to change. So to use climate change as an example, and this will scare everyone, including political leaders or even, even the Pope who came out just two days ago to talk about climate change. These are data in the bottom is, number one, in terms of climate change, on the research side, 97% of scientists in the world 
agree that climate change is the biggest problem today. So 97%, close to 100, okay? Second is promotion. We're not just talking about one person, two people here, or, or, or David Young on stage telling you there's a problem. The Pope is coming out to tell you there's a problem. President Obama actually called this, the, you know, denying or not dealing with climate change is the biggest threat to national security, quote, unquote. So we are not lacking heavy power in terms of promoting the message of climate change. But last year, and this is an annual poll, Gallup uh, polling agency in the US, every year they ask people, you know, what are the things that worry you around the world? And they list out like 10, 20 different issues. And on the issue of climate change, this is 2014, they ask, are you very worried? Are you deeply worried about climate change? And the answer is, 65% of Americans do not think it's a problem. Two-thirds, basically, don't even think it is a problem. Now, I'll be honest, I think that figure is pretty high when it comes to country-by-country country comparison. If you ask people in, I don't know, Singapore, I don't know if there's any research done on this, I know for sure that in Hong Kong, before Green Monday came up, like rarely, almost like one out of 100 people would talk about climate change. Like, that figure is much higher in terms of people who don't care or who don't know about the problem. And then, last but not least, is of the 35% people who care, how many take action? It's even less. Only 18% of the general public say that they are aware of climate change and they are trying to take action. Just now we were saying do or not do, right? These people are only trying to do and they don't even know how, what to do, what they can do. So that's the problem with the traditional funnel approach. And we are talking about a life and death situation of the planet, which is also the life and death situation of mankind. Now, I'm not saying that we have figured out the, the holy grail, we have figured figure out you know, the perfect answer to that. But one of the way that we do is we are not trying to go one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many even uh, in terms of trying to change the world. We say we got to engage the biggest players who can engage, who are already engaging millions or even billions of people. So in Hong Kong, what we did was we start from talking to the biggest fast food company. We talked to the biggest food service caterers. We talked to the biggest companies we talk to the government, of course, and engage them and say, join this movement. And then I'll go back and say, what do we ask them to do? And then let them impact the rest. So in Hong Kong, and then quickly expanding outside of Hong Kong and globally is we talk to companies like, uh, well, Google is one. We talk to Credit Suisse, we talk to HSBC, we talk to Standard Charter, we talk to McDonald's. McDonald's actually launched a veggie burger because of Green Monday which is unheard of. We talked to the biggest fast food chain in Hong Kong and asked them, launch a green menu. Change the proportion of your food service, of what you give people to choose from. It used to be, let's say, 80-20, or actually even 90-10. 90% is meat, 10% is vegetarian or you know, green-oriented. Now we say 30-70. 50-50 even on Monday. Now, we don't ask any company or any food service provider to remove meats completely because psychologically, if you remove meats, in the US, there's actually a movement called Meatless Monday. But in a sense, people feel that they're sacrificing. You're taking something away from them, and people don't feel like joining. But with green, it's something that everyone, whether you're eight, uh, three years old or 83 years old, it's okay, and everyone supports green and the environment. And we want to reduce the barrier, or in terms of the barrier to adopt this lifestyle, to become so simple that everyone can do. And basically, we don't just talk about raising awareness, we change the supply side. So if you look at that y-axis and x-axis, the y-axis is green awareness, 
but the x-axis is green options or alternative. Basically, demand and supply. Move that curve entirely so that we can move the equilibrium. Because if you are aware that food can change the world, but if there is no choice at your cafeteria, you are still eating your burger, you are still eating your hot dog. No choice. And we try to solve the problem that the traditional way cannot solve, which is you know, people are not, even after they hear something that is good for them, they are not taking action because of information overload, because of peer inertia, because of inconvenience, because of the lack of choice, because they think their effort is too little to change anything, or simply because they cannot sustain that behavior. We want to change or overcome all of those barriers. And the way to do that is create this huge, not just online, but also offline, so O2O, but particularly in the physical world, impact the biggest influencers and then get them to join this movement. And that is simply to change the way we talk about food. Now, I'll talk about the result and then quickly go into how we did it. Is the result is that in Hong Kong, before Green Monday exists, when we talk about vegetarian or vegetarian diet, most, well, 99 out of 100 people would only think of it as a religious thing, so you must be Buddhist. Now, I have been vegetarian for 15 years, and early days when I was telling people I'm a vegetarian, they asked me all sorts of stupid questions. You must have really serious health problem. What is it? Tell me. Did you encounter some breakup? Did you have a relationship problem? Now, I don't know how relationship problem and turning vegetarian have any <laughs> relationship. I don't know how that two connect. So I encounter, and, and of course, last but not least is, where do you get your protein? You know, are you, are you okay? I'm worried about your calcium level, your iron level. But then they look at me and they realize, that, you know, I seem healthier than they are. So. Before we exist, it was purely a religious thing, and that connotation that you must be Buddhist. And only 5% people had any sort of vegetarian routine or behavior, meaning once a week, twice a week, three days a week, or full time. Only 5%. Now, 23% of Hong Kong people are adopting Green Monday, which is to eat green at least one day a week. Actually, many of them, multiple days a week. And if you go to any restaurants or any catering, like from schools or corporate cafeteria, we are, going, we are penetrating, like in schools, 90% of the schools have Green Monday choice. 42% of students in all Hong Kong, out of three quarters of a million, 42% of students eat green at least one day a week. It used to be 4%. You, we are influencing millions. We're influencing millions. And by doing that, of course, we can calculate the carbon footprint reduction. And we tell corporations that this is your easiest way to reduce carbon footprint. It doesn't cost much. It involves education. It involves changing food service. It involves a lot of you know, public engagement. But it's a very cheap way to reduce carbon, yet this is a very the most severe global problem. Why Monday? Um, many people ask. Well, first, Monday is symbolic to a new start. And second, uh, we tend to overeat on weekends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, buffets, banquets, barbecue. Uh, in the US, we watch you know, football games on Sundays, so a lot of junk food. So Monday is a good chance to detox. And, but this is not the end all. We want to use food as the entry point, but not food as the end point. Whenever I have the chance to talk about Green Monday in a more spiritual context, I always like to describe Green Monday as from mindful eating to mindful living. We bundle the education into an action that you do anyway. So it's not like an additional thing that you are doing. We are bundling the education into an action that you will do regardless. You will never forget to eat, and like it or not, you will never forget Monday. 
these are ambassadors that um, you know different a, a lot of different from different sectors obviously from the entertainment business from the government leaders business leaders uh, you name it there, there, there are many of them and this is my final slide um, and to go into how we implement and execute Green Monday um, the next question that a lot of people come to me is wow you know this is a very powerful uh, platform and we deliberately use two words that are so simple that you know break any cultural barriers so whether you are in south of Korea, South East Asia, South of Africa, South America, uh, South of California, it doesn't matter. The two words, green and Monday, these are two of the simplest words. We deliberately choose that. It's because there is no barrier to spreading this. That is key to viralness. Something that needs to be viral has to be very simple. So, the next is after they say, wow, this is a powerful platform, so how do they join? And the next question they also ask is, so how do you sustain yourself? Can you make money? Or how are you a business? Now go back to that chart about my X and Y axis is, if we're trying to move just awareness, then yes, maybe you talk about a lack of business model. But if we're also trying to influence supply, which we have to because without supply, green behavior cannot happen, then you have an economy. When you're moving demand and supply, you have an economy. So under Green Monday, there are three entities. The first one is called Foundation, which is about public advocacy. The second one is called Solutions, which is an agency. It's a consulting agency, a marketing agency that helps any companies who wants to go green. Now people ask, you know, can they just join? Well, an airline, an airport, uh, a Google, a Credit Suisse, they all need different tailor-made solutions. You need to customize it for them. You cannot just post a poster on their wall and say, go Green Monday, and people will change. If it were that easy, then there would be no need for innovation. But exactly, it's because it is not that simple. So solution is about customization of programs, whether it's called corporate social responsibility, whether it's called marketing. And then finally, and the most exciting part, and the very Silicon Valley part of Green Monday, actually is called Green Monday Ventures, which is to invest and incubate startups that create green solutions, green options. We need innovation to provide alternative to people. If you know that your car is not good today, we need cars like Tesla, cars like Nissan Leaf, in order to change, right? Otherwise, we are not going back to Stone Age and walk. <laughs> that option doesn't work. We cannot walk from California to here or swim. So you need to have that alternative. And there is a green economy waiting to happen. So I guess from today, um, it's a great privilege to be sharing Green Monday with you. I hope you can bring this back to your home, to your family, to your workplace, um, to whichever country you are from. Definitely contact us if you want to partner together. Go Green Monday. Practice mindful eating, and from mindful eating to mindful living. Thank you.